Thank you. Happy Sabbath. There's a change of plan. Um, today we're going to have potluck earlier. We can have potluck right after this. So I'm going to give you the menu of the potluck and you tell me what you want to choose to eat afterwards. Okay? So the title, of the, the, the menu starts with a team. The team today is clean and uncleanness of food. Okay? And I choose this to prepare us because this is the season, right? We will have a lot of gatherings, caroling is going on, I heard. And there's a special Sabbath worship next week. It's great opportunity to witness. You have a lot of visitors coming. You come across a lot of people. So today's sermon is to prepare us for that witnessing, right? And all this celebration, without fail, it would involve, I hope, food, right? Since food is such an important element of our Asian culture. So, but at the same time, food is a great tool for witnessing if it is used the right way. Okay, so today I'm going to share with you a few pointers on how to do this. Okay, um, not that I am more qualified to tell you about what is the right way to witness, but a few of the experience and the mistakes that I've made. Okay, because we, we all have opportunity to learn, right? And, and um, the, the way we deliver the message makes a lot of difference. In fact, this morning I just got, I, I myself learned something as well. Um, so this morning I've been given the privilege to share the, to facilitate the adult cyber school lesson. Um, so people were trickling in. Okay, we were supposed to start at eight, uh, but by the time we, we, we've got the, the majority of the crowd in the, the class, it was close to 8.15. So, um, I usually save the best part of the lesson the last, but the point here is, if you want to enjoy the best part the last, you should try to come earlier. So one of the things that I keep on repeating as people trickle in is because I want to give a recap of what I talk about that they have missed. I mentioned for those who came late, okay? So I said, for those who came late, this is what I mentioned earlier. Now, then my wife gave me a feedback just now after we finished the lesson. She said, um, you know, instead of telling for those who came late, why not you say, uh, welcome for those who just arrived, what I mentioned earlier was so and so. Positive language, right? From positive versus what I said earlier, negative language. So, if you use positive language, you will make people more comfortable. For those who came late, if I said, for those who came late, the first thing is they'll feel guilty, right? So, I myself are learning. So, what I would like to invite you today, let's learn something about how do we use food to witness as we come to this citizen celebration. So, and I want to do this in the most comprehensive way. So, as I call this a confession of a Pharisee because it's my confession. I've made a lot of these mistakes in the past to use food as a way of witnessing or misuse or sometimes even abuse food as a way of witnessing. So, it may come across as... Um, I, I, okay, let me put it across very directly. I will bring up even questions or even Bible verses that challenges some of the things that we do. Okay, or how people use Bible verses to say that, you know, we Seventh-day Adventists are legalistic and why we emphasize so much on the food. Okay, so I'm going to use some of those things. Okay, but in order for me to do that in a structured manner. So let me go through this, okay, progressively. So I will start with the clean food and then I will continue with uncleanness due to the food, okay? But in order for us to have a good meal, okay, right? For example, if you want to hold a banquet in a hotel or you want to, you know, organize a wedding party, the first thing to do is what? Before you decide on the restaurant, you do for food, Tasting, right? So let's start with the food tasting first. Okay? So before I go to food tasting, let me explain to you what I'm going to start sharing with you, okay? The appetizer, clean food. Okay? Now, the whole definition of clean food, even if you go to the Bible, it has evolved. Okay? There are a few stages of what is being defined as clean food. If you look at Genesis, it starts with the plants, plant-based diet, right, in the Garden of Eden, right? God asked Adam and Eve, consume the fruits and nuts and no living beings, huh? okay? 
But as they got out from the garden, um, you know, after the flood, especially, okay, in Genesis 9, it says, every moving thing that lives. So there's an evolution. Now it's not just the plants, but things that move, okay? And then in Leviticus, that's when we start going into, wow, there are even things that move, there's clean and unclean, right? And we go into the intricacy of split hooves, seafood without scale. Anyway, what I'm going to show just now, the next slide was a list of what is considered as clean food in a Jewish context. So the Jewish call clean food as kosher, okay, K-O-S-H-E-R. So what they define as clean food and unclean food would then de determine whether you have committed a sin or not, okay? So the, the list of things, a very long and comprehensive list of things, like for example, a rabbit is not kosher, you know, lobster is not kosher, um, but turkey, dove, duck, oh, they are kosher, okay? So that's kosher versus non-kosher. Let me go to the next slide and see. Ha, safe. <laughs> and it's still evolving, okay? It's still evolving. Up to 1923, a Jewish rabbi, and this rabbi, by the way, is a very, very esteemed rabbi. Eh? He's from the Eastern European, the, the Orthodox Jewish uh, uh, Hebrew rabbi. Um, from, so Rabbi Bezazel Rosen, he's from the Ashkenazic descent. Meaning this is like the rabbi of rabbi. They're very, very strict, okay? They, 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 in the past, they used to prohibit the consumption of legumes, okay? But they then reclassified coffee as not legume, okay? As, okay, not a bean, but legume. So legume is allowed. So from that on, there are a lot of Jews who started consuming coffee. Because before that, they don't consume coffee because they consider it as not legume, right? So because of that, they sprung a company up in America called Maxwell House Coffee, okay? And today, if you go to America, most Jews will consume coffee branded as Maxwell House Coffee, okay? But my point is, I'm not advocating that we follow this, but my point is, it's evolving, okay? And this is a list, okay? It's a checklist to show you, comparing to all the religions, okay, in terms of how they prescribe their diet of do's and don'ts for information, the first rule here is ADV is Adventist, huh? okay? We have almost the most number of checklists uh, of things that we cannot do or don't do or discourage to do versus probably we are just behind only the Jewish, by the way, J-O-W, J-W, they have the, the most, okay? One more extra than us, okay? Food, clean food, okay? This is just for you to, if food is the measure, I think we are quite up there. Okay, we, if we can go number two, number one is the Jews, uh, we are number two already. But is that all? Okay, is that our witnessing tool? And this is where I now bring you to the real appetizer. Okay, the real appetizer. Just now was food tasting only, yeah? So we tasted the food already, right? I'll give you an evolution of food. Now let's go into what is defined really as clean food. And the Bible have very smart ways, you know, I've discovered a few smart ways of how they define it. So, there are three things that are symbolical meaning of food in the Bible. Because, like you mentioned, remember just now we read the scripture reading, food is more than just the food. It's, there are meanings behind it, okay? So, the three meanings I will share with you today is obedience, belonging, and gratitude, okay? Let's start with obedience. In Genesis 2, 16, it says, and 17, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. Right? Very straightforward. God used food as a way to test us on obedience. What you can or cannot do is about whether you obey or not. For the transgression of law is the, disobeying, the, the act of disobedience. Right? Very straightforward. So, it could be anything, you know. It could be, God said it could be, don't, don't, don't eat the plant or don't, don't touch the plant. It could be anything. But the point here is, the forbidden fruit is a test of obedience. Okay? The second one is belonging. Okay? So, in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17, it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? 
then that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So if many men destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. That's what you are. So it's very clear, we are the temple of God. So if we're the temple of God, the one who owns the temple is God, so we belong to God. So food is, for us to consume the right food to keep the temple clean and holy, we are acknowledging that we belong to God, right? Third one, gratefulness. Okay, this is my favorite, by the way. So in Matthew 6, 11, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. Okay, that means we acknowledge that it's God that giving, is the one that gives us. Okay, not through our effort, but by the mercy and grace of God. And in Psalms 11, uh, triple one, verse 5, it says, He provides food for those who fear Him. Okay, and He remembers His covenant forever. Right? So we are grateful. What we eat, what we choose to eat, shows how grateful we are to the God who provides for us. Right? So three simple messages. Number one, obedience. Number two, belonging. Number three, gratefulness. Okay? Three simple ways of witnessing about food. Now, is that all? Okay? Does food, now food definitely symbolizes a lot of things from salvation, but food does not equate to salvation. Okay, let me repeat. Food symbolizes salvation, but does not equate to salvation. Exodus 3, it says that, okay, the first symbol, the symbolism here is when we talk about the land of Canaan, God used milk and honey to demonstrate that, yeah, I, God used food or form of food to demonstrate that this is where you get salvation from the land, the promised land. And in Exodus 3.12, it, it says that, okay, when, you, when the people are brought to, out of Egypt, you will worship on this mountain. Okay? So food is not the end, but the beginning of witnessing. Okay? The beginning of witnessing. Why I say that is here is now we enter into the main course. Okay? So just now there was an appetizer only, right? So now the main course here is what is defined as uncleanness of food or unclean food. Okay? Now, I am not medically trained. I am not a nutritionist. So this is not about whether um, if there is this trace of oil in the pan is clean or not, or whether this meat has higher cholesterol or not, I'm not going to talk about that. Okay? In fact, this morning, my breakfast, I can share with you, was some slight controversy involved because um, we are, we are traveling in the next one week or so, so we need to clear the fridge up. So um, my breakfast this morning was um, sweet potatoes, carrot cake that my wife made, and some very old grapes because the grapes were cheap and we bought the grapes. So because it's very old, some grapes were a bit, if I could call it, fermented. So there may be some trace of alcohol there. Okay, this is not what I'm going to go about. Okay, this is not what this uncleanness is about. We're talking about symbols here, okay? Symbols of unclean food. And what are the symbolical meanings of the unclean food? Okay, when the Bible talks about unclean, okay, or what that God does not desire us to consume from food point, the word is used as abomination, okay? When you infringe the food laws, it's abomination, okay? And, and the, the, the specific reference here is this word called tova, okay? And tova is referred here in the same category when it comes to unclean food, right? You see there, the third one, is a ritual sense, okay? Together with idolatry. So very serious, you know, it's not a joke, okay? When it comes to abomination due to food, it's a very serious matter. But remember, it's more than just food. So the abomination related to food here, there is a symbolical meaning behind it. And I'm going to give you three of them, okay? The first one is the act of blaming. The second one is how we use food to judge. And third, how we use food to discriminate, okay? So let me go to the first one. Have you tried to explain this to your ch child before, right? Oh, because Adam and Eve committed sin in the Garden of Eden and Adam commit ate the apple, so that's why all men have this protruding element in your throat called the Adam's apple, okay? So we blame the apple, okay? It's the apple that get, caught us to sin, all right? The point here is, is, 
In Mark 7, 15, 12, 12, 22 to 22, it says, there's nothing outside a person that by going into him that can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Okay? And what comes out of a person is what that defiles him. Repeat. Not what that goes in, it's what that comes out. So where's the source of blame here? Okay? It's not about what that goes in. So as we talk about this, um, you know, today we, 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 we have people asking us, okay, why we do not take certain food or take certain drink? Okay? Yep, health, lifestyle is important, you know, but we need to be very careful to avoid the situation where, oh, when someone falls sick, we start witch hunting and say, hey, what does this person eat uh, or don't eat? Right? We are not using food to find the source of blame. Number two, okay? Corinthians 8.8 8 says, Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat or no better off if we do. Okay? And if we start using that to determine whether it will commend us to be of higher regard by God, we are hindering the whole point of faith and the role of faith in our relationship with God. Next, judgment. Okay? This is the part that comes about when we start looking at how, does we, how do we use food to judge? Or oh, food as a symbolical meaning of how judgment is being passed. Okay, in Corinthians 11, 27 and 30, it says that whoever, that, like, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks from the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Okay, so he says, let a person examine himself. Okay, examine himself. Huh? Not let the pastor examine him, not let the elder examine him, not let the deacon examine him. Let the person examine himself. Okay, and the judgment on himself. What is the emphasis here? It's between you and God. There's no other business for any other person to come in and judge you for what you eat or don't eat. It's as simple as that. Okay? So who is the judge here? Okay? Colossians 2.16 says that let no one act as your judge in regard to food, okay? But the substance belongs to Christ, okay? So, when we start judging, or we start passing judgment on what people eat or don't eat, we are abusing the symbolical meaning of food. So who are we to judge? Because when we start passing the judgment, we start invoking the uncleanness of food. The third one, discrimination. Okay? In Acts 10 14, it says that by no means, Lord, have I ever eaten anything unclean. Okay? And he emphasized this three times. This is what Peter, by the way, talking. Okay? And the context of this is this was when Peter was given the vision that a lot of unclean food was put across him for, for him to consume, but he chose not to eat them. But we know that the context of the story eventually is because God wants him to understand that there will be Gentiles visiting him and that he needs to accept the Gentiles for who they are, okay, and not make them Jews, okay, because the salvation is available to all of them, okay. And 28 29 says that a man can associate with foreigner, okay and show him that you should not call any man unholy or unclean, okay? So, the point here is to emphasize that when food is used wrongly, it can be a tool to discriminate through biases. And that's the part that sometimes got us into trouble, or sometimes hinder others from embracing the jewel and the wonderful message that we have, okay? Because we are using it to pass judgment and this judgment turns people away from us. 
to claim that we are superior and they are inferior for what they eat versus what we don't eat. Mark 7, 5 says that, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And Acts 10, 34, 35 says, that, I must certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him is welcomed by him. So when we discriminate, okay, we are excluding people from God. We are turning people away from God. So we know the uncleanness problem is summarized in three things blame, judgment, discrimination. Okay? Romans 14 says that I know and am persuaded that nothing is unclean in itself. And verse 1 to 2 says that no one, let no one, let now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment. And third, verse 22 to 21, 20, 20 to 21, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of what? Food. Okay? Blame, judgment, discrimination. Right? Very clearly stated, it's almost God as if know that we will use food for this purpose in the wrong way. And that is where this becomes the obstacles for us to witness. On the flip side, okay, I will leave the best part, the most sinful part for the last, the dessert. Okay? Now that you have eaten the appetizer, the main course, not the dessert. Same three words, obedience, belonging, and gratefulness. Right? This paragraph here, by abstaining from unclean foods, God be, God's people demonstrate their gratefulness for their redemption from corrupt, unclean world around them. Okay, And to introduce anything unclean into the body temple where God's spirit dwells is less than God's ideal. This is the 22nd fundamental of the 28th. It's not my idea. It's not my great idea. It is the 22nd fundamental. If you look at the 22nd fundamental, the three words there that are coming most strongly is food is about obedience, belonging, and gratefulness. When was the last time we used this three element to use food to witness for us? Versus blame, judgment, and discrimination. My point here is we need to relook at how we use our sweetest asset. Okay, among our sweetest assets, I won't say the sweetest, but one of our sweetest assets for the purpose of glorifying Him, not hindering and turning people away from Him. Lastly, okay, if food, if our body is the temple of God, okay, if our body indeed is the temple of God, and today the temple of God is the church, okay, don't go to church. But be the church. Thank you.